Hey everyone, this is part two of a two-part series where I go over all the DLC fighter packs Smash Ultimate got and rank them all based on a bunch of stuff, including my opinion. I won't keep this intro long at all since the last part was way longer already than it had any right to be, so let's just jump right into it. Except for the fact that I'm first gonna talk about our lovely sponsor, Skillshare! Woo, yeah! Thank you for supporting the channel! Skillshare is an online teaching tool where you can learn all about, well, literally anything. And as a full-time YouTuber with a fancy checkmark next to my name, I get asked a lot about how you should start if you also want to get big on YouTube, or at least start growing on the platform. Where almost everyone's faults lie here is that they immediately look at the big creators they watch and think they need to be just like them with all their fancy equipment. Nowadays, I have a bunch of expensive stuff I use to make videos, like this mic arm, three monitors, this thing. Brown. But to get started, you really don't need any of that. Marcus Brownlee, who you might know as MKBHD on YouTube, has a class on Skillshare where he goes over this exact process of how to make YouTube videos and become successful on the platform. I actually watched it all the way through a while back and it's really good. Even if you don't have all the expensive equipment he uses, you'll still get a great idea on how to structure a video in a way that keeps it engaging. Even I learned some stuff from it, which I'll definitely be applying to my following videos. So really, go check it out. The first 1000 people to use the code pjiggle06221 or click my special link in the description will get their first month completely free. So hurry up, they're not giving these deals away forever. Massive thanks again to Skillshare for supporting the channel today, definitely check it out in the description. And now, let's get into the actual video. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, you should do that first since we go over a lot of stuff there that I won't repeat in this video. But if you have and you want a quick rundown of the ranking so far... The Joker pack was a 6 out of 10. I'm not a fan of how the character plays and is designed, but the music and stage is okay. Hero got a 5 out of 10, the music is horrible and the stage is just okay, but the character is incredibly fun, which is where pretty much all of the 5 out of 10 came from. Banjo and Kasui got a 9 out of 10, almost perfect and would have been a 10 out of 10 if the stage was a bit better. The Terry pack actually was perfect and got a 10 out of 10. Character is super fun and well designed, it brought my favorite stage in the game, and the music selection it came with is illegally good. Byleth got a 2 out of 10. I don't like the character, his stage is actually horrible, and the music selection is pretty disappointing too, even though it has some amazing non-remixed songs in it. And finally, we didn't give Piranha Planet a ranking since it isn't actually part of a fighter's pack and thus doesn't come with a stage or music, although I do like the character and the addition is very funny. Anyways, kicking off Smash Ultimate's second fighter's pass, we have... <sighs> right, Min Min from ARMS. I said before that I don't really mind what game a DLC character comes from, which is true, but was an ARMS character really the best way to start off and convince people to buy the second fighter's pass? I don't think so, Nintendo, especially since Fighters Pass 1 started with the mind-blowing edition of Joker. But whatever, let's get into the character. I actually think ARMS, the game, has fantastic character designs and a great concept. Personally, I'm not a fan of the game, might be me not liking most fighting games or just ARMS' gameplay specifically, but I do have a lot of respect for it and I think a character from the game is a pretty natural fit for Smash Brothers, especially since Smash can also have a big focus on playing around your character's range. So to me, even though I would have preferred at another time, I am totally fine with Min Min's addition. I also just think it's neat how they didn't just put in the face of the game, but instead someone who is more unique. If they asked me to pick an ARMS character to be added to Smash, I honestly probably also would have picked Min Min. She clearly had the most potential to be as unique as possible in Smash. Now all that praise aside, wow do I not like this character. <sighs> I really didn't want to start this video off negatively. To play Min Min optimally, you pretty much just use variants of this move this one move dragon jab ram ram jab megawatt jab dragon side smash ram ram side smash megawatt side smash and all of the above angled up or down yeah she obviously has more moves but have you ever seen a competitive player use min min this is 90 percent of what they do and i don't blame them for it it's just how the character is designed and personally i think this makes min min the single most boring character to watch as a spectator took a lot to overtake sonic and also, I'm just not really a fan of playing her because of this. I like getting close to my opponents in Smash, and that is just not what Min Min does. I don't like zoning people out. As weird as it may sound after all that, I do strangely like the idea behind how she plays. Instead of the usual A is for regular attacks and B is for special attacks, with Min Min they control her left and right arms respectively, making for a character that controls like no other. It's pretty surreal to do something like a neutral air or a gentleman jab combo with the special button. So yeah, gameplay wise she's strange for me. She's by far one of my least favorite characters to both play and watch, though I think how they implemented her is pretty cool, and at least her mechanic of her left arm powering up after a throw incentivizes her to get at least a little bit close. Her stage on the other hand, uh, cool I guess. It has this gimmick where the edges and middle platforms become bounce pads that you can jump off of with a high powered jump, alongside sometimes getting these far off side platforms that bounce you up the same way upon touching them. 
just jump as a hitbox that you can combo into which is kind of cool but i don't like these ceilings at all that it has they were probably put there so you can have plays like this but i'd rather there isn't something that will almost always get in the way of chaos off the top you know Anyways, I never hear anybody talk about this stage, let alone see them play on it. It's honestly one of the more forgettable stages in my opinion, and if you play it with hazards turned off, then it's just the same thing as Smashville, except with those dumb ceilings. So yeah, the stage is kind of a miss too, but of course we have one last thing to go over, the music. 18 songs are included, which is honestly a very respectable amount, but there are only two new remixes. If you watched the last video, you know that I care way more about new remixes a DLC pack brings than non-remixes, since those are just ports and technically nothing new since the songs already existed. The two remixes Min Min brought make a ton of sense though. It's the ARMS main theme and the song it plays on the Ramen Bowl stage, which is their home stage in ARMS. They aren't bad too. I prefer Ramen Bowl, but both are solid in my opinion. And for the non-remixes, yeah, they're okay. Again, I usually don't care too much about them, and the ARMS soundtrack is just okay in my book, although I really like Buster Beach, DNA Lab, and Sparring Ring. I would have liked maybe one or two new remixes, but it did bring a solid amount of music overall, even though they're mostly ports, so this music selection is just okay, I guess. Now, what do I think of this DLC pack as a whole? Well, the best thing I had to say about it is that the song list is just okay. The character is the most boring character in the game in multiple ways, and the stage is just kind of bland and forgettable. It's not even like a super pretty stage or anything to make up for it. So I'm gonna give this pack a very weak 1 out of 10. Just barely not giving it a 0 because at least it came with two remixes that aren't too bad. But that's really about it. Wow, that was underwhelming. Good job, Min Min. So after two stinkers in a row to both close out and start up a fighter's pass, what did they add after Min Min? Yep. I can die happy now. Backstory time. Since Brawl all the way back in the ancient year of 2008, my most wanted Smash character has been Geno from Super Mario RPG. But after not getting my wish in Brawl, base game Smash 4, Smash 4's DLC, and base game Ultimate, alongside getting my heart broken because of his Mii costume in Smash 4, I kinda gave up wishing for him a handful of DLC characters into Ultimate. Now why am I telling you about this? Because after giving up on Geno, my most wanted character became Steve. Even back in the Smash 4 days, I kind of wished for Steve already, but was too embarrassed to say it because in that time Minecraft was cringe and not based on the internet for some reason, and I really cared about that because I was like a dumb 15 year old. So what was my reaction to Steve being announced for Smash Ultimate? Oh f <laughs> Oh my god, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> oh, this is real. Oh my god! Oh, I'm happy. This is unironically so far the DLC character I care the most about. I am so fucking happy for this. Yeah, I usually don't really get loud for announcements that make me happy, even when they're this big. But trust me when I say I was overjoyed. I'm repeating myself here, but again, it doesn't really matter to me what game a Smash Fighter comes from as long as they're fun in Smash. But Steve is a bit different. Minecraft is a really special game to me. One of my brothers, who is 8 years older than me, got into Minecraft when it was still in its in-depth stage all the way back in 2009, when I was 10 and my brother 18, at which point the game looked like this, and just had crafting added to it. Yeah, half the game's name. He got me to try out the game and we played it a lot together, not necessarily in multiplayer since it was new and we didn't know how to back then, but he would just show me what he's making, he'd let me play survival on his computer, and overall I credit those times as some of the first real moments of me bonding with him since I had trouble talking about common interests as a kid, even among my own family. I continued to play Minecraft for years after that and to this day it's one of my favorite games of all time. I can always go back to it and it's great at cheering me up when I'm having a bad day. As uh, cringe as this sounds, Minecraft has been there for me forever now and it helped me shape me into the person I am today. So seeing it get added to Smash Bros, the game that undoubtedly changed my life the most since it's my job now, it truly made me happy. Even if you can't really see it in this reaction, the 9 year old me was screaming from joy inside my head. Anyway, sappy backstory aside, I look forward to all the comments calling me cringy because I love a game. But the question now is, what do I think of Steve's actual implementation in Smash? It's pretty much perfect. I'm sure I don't need to tell you what Minecraft is like since you probably already know, I mean it is the best selling video game in the world after all, but Mr. Sakurai and the Smash team did a phenomenal job translating Minecraft into Smash. Not only does he look and play exactly how he should, but pretty much all important Minecraft mechanics are baked into his moveset, using different tools, mining resources, placing blocks, crafting to get better tools to do better, it all makes for an extremely different and creatively designed character. I love his moveset too. 
I'm sadly not exactly good as him, but I enjoy playing him a lot, especially since he can be oh so stupid, and I don't necessarily need to win with him to have a good time. It's just fun to see what kind of crazy stuff you can do in a match. I don't really have a lot more to say about him gameplay wise, he's pretty much perfect and one of my favorite characters in the game. I also love watching him be used by a top level competitive player. Seeing Twitter get mad is always fun. Well, let's just move on to his stage, Minecraft World. Really should have been called New World. This stage is actually 6 stages in one, kinda. Because worlds in Minecraft are randomly generated, they gave this stage 6 different forms it randomly picks from every time you choose the stage. I guess making the blocks on it actually completely random each time was too chaotic, which makes sense to me. This gives the stage a completely different look each time, which is awesome, since Minecraft has a lot of different visual themes in its areas, and this way you get to experience some of that for yourself in Smash. But more importantly, each form has a different platform layout, and if you play on hazardless mode, the stage starts without any of the destructible blocks on it, meaning that the stage is essentially just 6 completely new tournament legal stages, which is insane to me. Except for the fact that competitive ultimate players don't actually play on the stage, but whatever, I do and I love it. You can actually pick which form you want to by holding down a specific button combination when picking the stage on the select screen, so it really is just like getting to choose from 6 stages with unique layouts. I love stages with a day and night cycle, and naturally Minecraft World has one as well. Playing on the stage as Steve specifically is a super unique experience too, since you have to get all around to get different materials, which isn't the case for the commonly picked Omega and Battlefield forms. Beyond all that, this stage just looks like it's ripped straight from Minecraft. It's one of my favorite looking stages in the game, which sounds silly since it's just made up of Minecraft blocks, but it's true. The fact that in the first form you see basically an entire village's day and night cycle happening in the background is awesome. Villagers collecting and planting new crops in the day, monsters coming out at night and making the villagers hide in their houses, the monsters burning up during sunrise and then the cycle repeats starting with the villagers collecting their newly grown crops again. It's all fantastic. You can even see the villagers napping in their beds at night if you peek through the windows. I could go on and on about this stage, but I really should compose myself. So let's just move on to the music and uh, huh, this is a really weird one. There are only 7 songs included, which isn't a lot, but 6 of them are new remixes, which is a lot. Or at least above average for DLCs up until this point, being on a par with Banjo and above Joker, Hero, Byleth and Min Min, while of course being trounced by Terry, but whatever, nobody can blame him for that. Now that aside, what immediately caught everyone's attention with this music list is that there's no music included from the original Minecraft game soundtrack by C418, not even a remix or anything. Instead, the songs come from Minecraft Earth, Minecraft Dungeons, and Minecraft Bedrock Edition's battle meeting games. In the Sakurai Presents Steve and Alex presentation, they said that this was because Minecraft music is too relaxing for a fighting game, which to me seems like a quick excuse to hide some other reasons considering there are remixes of stuff like Animal Crossing music. There are a bunch of online theories as to why there wouldn't be at least a remix of an original Minecraft song in here, relating to the composer C418 not allowing it for one reason or another, but I won't go into any of that here. It is upsetting that there's no remix of an original Minecraft song though, I would have killed for a Sweden remix. That's like THE Minecraft song and I've heard plenty of fanmade remixes that would work perfectly in Smash. Anyways that all aside, the music is ranging in quality to me, though I mostly like it even if it's a small selection overall. Hal and Dalarna and Earth are two of my favorite remixes in the whole game, while Dance of the Blocks and Glide are pretty good too, and the one non-remix, Clockworks Crafter, is just okay. All in all, what do I think of this DLC pack? Well take a guess. The Steve DLC, my most wanted Smash character, gets an extremely solid 9 out of 10 for me. It's so painfully close to being a 10 out of 10. It kind of feels wrong for me to dock a point since there's no original Minecraft song in here, even though there are 6 new remixes, but it honestly is pretty upsetting. I don't do half points, but if I did, this would be a 9.5 out of 10 easily. The character and the stage are absolutely fantastic and clearly made with an insane amount of love for Minecraft, while the music selection definitely isn't bad either. So after Steve, they announced that the next Smash Fighter will be revealed at that year's Game Awards. And who did they decide to add after the banger of a DLC pack that was Steve? Well, it really could have been anyone since before that we got the eh edition of Min Min. So logically after those two, the only option was, oh my god, what the hell? So yeah, Sephiroth. Yeah, Sephiroth. This was a huge surprise that absolutely nobody saw coming. Excluding me, of course, as I'm a Smash genie. Oh, who am I kidding? This has got to be one of the most out of left field unexpected Smash editions of all time. And now it's of course time for me to start talking about what I think it is DLC pack, right? Well, yeah, and uh, yeah, people are not gonna like me anymore after this segment. Uh, let's start positive. The edition itself. Oh god, never mind, I don't really care. It was a shock for sure, and I get it, Sephiroth is one of the most iconic video game villains of all time. But hey, Square Enix, you know that Final Fantasy is a whole franchise, right? It's not just 7. 
here's my history with the series. I fully beaten the original 7 and 7 remake. That's it. So obviously I am not a huge Final Fantasy guy or anything, but I think it would have been better if they added a character from another entry in the series, or if Sephiroth brought any content at all that isn't from 7, which, spoilers, he didn't. That's my main issue with Sephiroth actually. I get that 7 is by far the most famous and iconic game in the series, but I hate it when the chance to represent more games gets tossed aside just because of one game being way more popular. That's like if in the next Smash game they remove all Zelda content and characters that's not Link, and then add more Breath of the Wild characters, stages, and music instead, because it's by far the best selling game in the series right now. One thing I do love about Sephiroth's inclusion is how he was released, as weird as that sounds. After his showcase, he was set to release a week later, but they had a special in-game event where you could unlock him early if you beat the Sephiroth challenge, which they did because of his iconic boss status, which is just absolutely fantastic. This won't affect his score at all since it was a limited time event, but I still wanted to bring it up. That all aside, let's move on to his actual moveset. And guess what? I don't like it! Woo, yeah! PJ opinions are famous for being good, am I right? Yeah! So Sephiroth has a big katana, and he's rather tall himself. So naturally, he's going to play around having huge range, which also means he is of course going to play really, really slow, which also means I'm not a fan. Most of his attacks are big wide swings with his katana, and I do like the small gimmick of stab moves being strongest at the tips, and slash moves being strongest in the middle, but he plays kind of awkward to me and I don't really know how to explain it. It's not the same thing as Byleth where he's awkward because he's almost universally slow, with Sephiroth it's kind of because, for example, his side special is fast and snappy, while his neutral special is slow, even with no charge. Neutral air is fast while all his other aerials are slow. Down tilt is fast while forward tilt is slow. I usually don't mind characters that vary wildly between slow and fast attacks. I mean, I love playing Ganondorf and he kind of has that too. But something about Sephiroth just feels off to me. Maybe it's because with him it's a pretty extreme difference in speed across most of his moves. That aside, I just don't like his playstyle either. Like I said, I'm not a fan of playing defensively with big attacks. And Sephiroth is that 100% with his big range and projectile specials. One move I'm a big fan of though is his up special. It's just really satisfying to hit all the hits, especially if you take them into the blast zone with you. But then on the contrary, I don't like his winged form mechanic. He gets it if he has more damage than his opponents, but it's never the same amount of percentage. And the benefits, while I of course like him getting faster and another midair jump, I feel like smash attacks getting super armor is kind of random and not something that changes how he plays a lot. And on top of that, I kind of hate how it goes away if you get a KO while in this form. Like, yay, I activated my comeback mechanic, which makes my character more fun. But oh, now I did well, KOing the opponent, which makes me lose my powered up fun state. Guess now I'll wait until I die and once again are at enough percent until I enjoy my character more again. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a well designed and balanced mechanic, but that doesn't mean I have to like how it works, you know? It's fine as it is, it's just not my thing. Moving on to his stage, wow, this is actually amazing. Northern Cave may be named after a location in Final Fantasy VII, but in reality it's much more than that. Instead it's more like a theme park ride that takes you through the entire ending segment of that game. Spoilers for Final Fantasy VII Head, even though I'm sure you already know about it, it may be similar in the remake, so I'm giving a warning anyways, please just skip to this time, so if you know we should see a dash warning, 3, 2, 1. Yeah, I can talk really fast, that's a nice skill of mine, but okay. You start at the entrance of Northern Crater, then go down alongside the actual airship you use in the game. You see the path you take down to the final boss encounters, there you see the spot where you fight Jenova for the final time, which is also what the main platform is based on. After that, you see the arena where you fight Sephiroth's first form, with Holy in the background just like in the original game. Then it transitions into the game's ending cutscene moments, where first Holy activates and you have to make a mad dash out of the cave with the high wind ship all to stop the meteor Sephiroth summoned which is almost about to hit and destroy the planet. The light from Holy starts trying to stop it, but it's not enough. So the planet itself comes to help stop the meteor too with Lifestream, at which point it succeeds. The screen goes white and the cycle starts all over again. I think this is just such a fantastic idea for a stage. Instead of just a central location like most other stages in the game, it's a whole closing segment of a game and I think it's awesome. The actual stage itself is nice too. You know me, I love tournament legal layouts, and this is as basic as it gets. I love it. Not much more I can say there. So the stage is top notch, but what stage is complete without good background music, right? And uh, yeah, keep looking. Okay, that's a little harsh. Obviously this stage has good music, but it's weird. The music selection Sephiroth brought kind of just makes me upset and disappointed. Rant time. We all know how when Cloud was added to Smash 4, he came with two and only two songs from Final Fantasy 7, which weren't remixed and they were literally the only songs available on the Midgar stage. And on top of that, they were just the main battle theme and the main boss battle theme. Talk about bland. 
good songs, but Jesus, she couldn't have thrown in at least one more creatively picked song or something? Obviously, a lot of people were upset at this, and rightfully so. This was clearly Square Enix being anal about their music copyright, because no, we don't want to give the Smash team the opportunity to rearrange our songs that people have an emotional and deep connection with. Then, three years later when Smash Ultimate came out and Cloud came back, he did not come with any new music. It was literally just the same two songs again, and no new remixes. But don't worry guys, another two years after that, Sephiroth was added, and they actually made some new music this time and brought in more original songs from Final Fantasy VII. Woo, yeah, all is forgiven, they fixed the Final Fantasy music problem in Smash, woo, yeah, everyone was happy about this. Except me, I was just annoyed. See, the music selection Sephiroth brought to Smash doesn't excite me at all, because it's the music that Cloud should have come with back in Smash 4, five years ago. And if not there, it should have at least been a part of base game ultimate since Cloud and Midgar came back. And then later when Sephiroth was added, he should have come with even more Final Fantasy music. But no, we had to wait more than five years for Final Fantasy to get some substantial music in Super Smash Bros. A series that prides itself on its incredible music remixes from countless different franchises people love. And even then, all the Final Fantasy music in Smash is just from the Final Fantasy VII game and the Final Fantasy VII movie. No other games in the series because they don't exist, am I right? Look, this is the game with Cloud and Tifa and Barrett. You love those guys, right? And Sid. Did you know there's a character named Sid in every Final Fantasy game? No, you don't because there's only one Final Fantasy game and it's seven. Woo! I'm sorry. It just bugs me a lot how people are acting like Square giving us such a pathetic lineup of Final Fantasy songs for five years was justified after Sephiroth added a few more songs. In the Mr. Sakurai Percent Sephiroth Showcase, he literally goes on for a bit about how copyright approval sucks and I feel like this is him venting his frustration in working with Square when it comes to licensing issues. Big rant aside, let's get into the actual music. 9 songs, 4 of which are new remixes, and I'll hand it to them at least that 4 new remixes is good. There should have been more than 4 now because, you know, but 4 new remixes in any DLC pack is fine. Opening bombing mission is probably the second most iconic Final Fantasy VII song of all time behind One Winged Angel, and its remix is great. Main theme is a banger too, and I love the fact that they made a Cosmo Canyon remix. It was a pretty important location in the original game, but nothing Omega big, so I like the fact that they didn't just stick to the four most famous songs in the game or something. This is a nice surprise. And Aerith's theme is nice too. I kinda think it misses the point of that song completely since it sounds way too upbeat and happy, while when I hear the original I almost burst into tears because... That's the point of the song. But it makes sense for Smash, I guess, and it sounds good. I don't know what more to say about the rest of the music. I think it's cool that there is some music from a movie in Smash now, but personally, I'm not a fan of the actual tracks. Yunofa is one of the best songs in the original game, though, and I love that it's in Smash now. And one last thing, Sephiroth obviously added Final Fantasy VII spirits too, and also updated Cloud's old spirit to actually be his original artwork now. Good job, Sephiroth. I mean, this should have been part of the base game because of Cloud being still in it, but good job, Sephiroth. Too bad I don't care at all about spirits though. Anyways, yeah, that was a lot of complaining, I'm sorry about that. I'm sure you didn't expect that since everyone loves this DLC pack, but not me. The stage was really the only thing I had nothing negative to say about, so I'm gonna give this pack a... a... <sighs> I've already accepted that people aren't gonna like me for this. A 4 out of 10. He's similar to Hero in that regard since I gave that pack a 5 for having an okay stage, bad music, but a really fun character to play which is the most important part of a DLC pack for me. The difference with Sephiroth why he scored lower is that most importantly, I don't like his moveset at all. And the music, while 100% better than Hero's music, actively pisses me off in a dozen different ways. So that DLC pack clearly let me down a lot. Surely the next character will cheer me right back up, right? Oh, uh, all right then. Okay, first things first before I start spewing more opinions everywhere. Xenoblade 2 fans? Shake? Can we shake? It's no secret that I have a strong distaste for Xenoblade 2, but I already said that what game a fighter comes from doesn't matter to me, and I promise I won't hold me not liking Pyra and Mithra's home game against them in Smash, okay? So can we shake? Ah, thank you, I'm glad we could put our differences aside. Anyways, yeah, Pyra and Mithra from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 join Smash Ultimate as two characters in one. Kinda like how Pokemon Trainer works, and I think that's pretty cool actually. What sets them apart as swap characters compared to Pokemon Trainer is that Pyra and Mithra have more or less the same moveset but with different stats, instead of how Squirtle, Ikrasaur, and Charizard are completely different in literally every way, including moveset. Their normals are all pretty much the same move like I said, but Mithra's attacks are way faster than Pyra, while in turn she does a lot less damage and knockback than her. 
This means Mithra is a lot more focused on quick combos and racking up damage, while Pyra is more focused on finishing off opponents that have taken a lot of damage with slow but strong hits. On top of that, their specials are all completely different too, meaning that they're not literally just the same character but with different stats. I think this makes for a very fun character to play. Most of the time you'll probably be using Mithra, and then only switching to Pyra when you've done enough damage for her to quickly take stocks, and then it's back to Mithra again. But if you want to, you can totally just play only one of them, as getting KO'd doesn't force you to switch, which does happen if you get KO'd as Pokemon Trainer. So that's the character, a big success. I personally enjoy playing as Mithra more, but as a duo they're very well designed I believe. Except for the fact that Mithra and not Pyra has this foresight mechanic on her dodges. She really didn't need that in my opinion and it makes her disadvantage state a lot better than Pyra's when it already would have been better because she has faster moves. But it's not a huge deal I suppose. Moving on to the stage, Cloud Sea of All Rest. Yup, that sure is a Cloud Sea. And I don't know about you guys, but this is also one of the more lackluster and forgettable stages to me. Visually, it looks pretty good at a first glance. See, I think the Cloud Sea itself and the Titans in the background look very nice. But then there are two things on the stage that don't look very nice. First of all, the cameos in the background. It's the same thing as with the Three Houses cameos. Their textures are just so low quality, but somehow it's even worse here. Like seriously, why does it look like this? It gives me Seelomite Chronicles Wii Fives just with a slightly higher poly count. And speaking of low quality, the World Tree. Oh my god, what happened here? Like seriously, look at me and tell me this doesn't look awful. When this shot came in the reveal trailer, I burst out laughing because it's almost comical with the Rex Me costume behind Pyra looking at this awful PNG in the distance. Like seriously, this has to be the lowest quality stage asset in the game, at least relative to its size. I feel like they knew how bad this looks because if you start a match on this stage, it's not in view at all, and you can only see it if you pause, go into camera mode, and then turn to the left, then you can see it. Because the stage is constantly moving, eventually it will show up again, but it takes a whopping 10 minutes to do so. No Smash match is gonna last that long, so it really feels to me like they were just trying to hide it. The last thing I can say about the stage is that I like Azurda's commentary over the match, the dragon thing you're on, because he actually reacts to what is going on. If someone gets KO'd, he can call you out for it. Oh, very clever. And he has special lines for if Pyra and Myth are in the match too. Hang in there now, Pyra! He has so many unique lines, in fact, that they even gave him two for when Pyra and Mithra used their final smash on top of him. Witness our power! Oh, that's delightfully warm! Oh, the splendor of youth! Other than that, I don't really pick this stage at all. The layout isn't my cup of tea, and if you play it in the battlefield or Omega form, the main thing I like about it is gone, being Azura's voice line since he's not there. Well, moving on to the music, yikes, I don't like this. So it comes with 16 tracks, which is very respectable, but you know me by now, and I only really care about the new remixes, and the three this DLC packs brought, all blow. Counterattack is one of the best songs in Xenoblade 2, but the Smash remix just sucks, man. I guess it's passable on its own, but it doesn't hold a candle at all to the original, and pretty much all Xenoblade fans I know agree on that. It never really hits the same feeling, you know? I mean, just compare these two drops between the original and the remix. Yeah, the Smash version sucks. And they didn't even include the original. That's stupid. Tiger Tiger is just kind of... No, I don't want to listen to this. I mean, it's cool, I guess, that they pick music from such a random point in the game to remix. But it's a medley of multiple songs in that spot, and the transitions are really bad. It just stops and plays the next part each time. And then we have Xenoblade Chronicles 2 medley. And I have the same issues with this song as I do with the original Xenoblade Chronicles medley from Smash 4 and that's that the transitions are awful, and the parts that are actually remixed because most of it isn't, I would have much rather had them as full new remixes instead of being crunched into this medley. The funny thing about Pyra and Mithra's music pack is that it's the only one where I vastly prefer the non-remix tracks. Xenoblade 2 has a fantastic soundtrack, and they brought over a lot of bangers, like Incoming, Deathmatch with Torna, You Will Recall Our Names, and Battle Torna. 
I'm super upset that Tantal Day isn't in here though. That's my favorite song in the original game. It's in the medley where it's the best part of the song, even though it's not remixed. So yeah, that's the Pyramithra DLC pack. The most, yeah, it's fine, I guess, pack of all time. The characters are really fun, it's two of them which is awesome, but the stage is kind of bland, and the music, while the non-remix tracks are great, I ultimately care more about the remix tracks which suck. So I'm giving this pack a 7 out of 10. I was extremely close to giving it a 6, but at the end of the day it is two characters in one, which is pretty big even if they are similar. So in a pack with an enjoyable character, bland stage, and a disappointing music selection, I'd say a 7 out of 10 is being very generous. It definitely would have gotten a 6 if it was only one character though. Before we knew who all the characters in the second Fighters Pass were going to be, we thought Fighter number 81 would be the last one, but then Pyra and Mithra happened, being two characters in one, meaning the real final fighter would be number 82 instead. But that aside, who did end up being number 81? Oh my god, finally. It ended up being Kazuya Mishima from Tekken. And I don't know about you guys, but when this was announced, I just kind of thought to myself, why did this take so long? Because a Tekken rep was inevitable. I don't know why they waited until the second to last character to do this. Tekken is one of the biggest fighting game franchises in the world, and it's made by Bandai Namco. You know, the same guys that make Smash Ultimate. And it was already represented in Smash before that with a Mii costume and Pac-Man's taunt. Don't take this the wrong way, but this announcement didn't excite me a lot because 1. It was super inevitable, and 2. I don't think it would have felt right for them to end the Smash DLC with a Tekken character. So after Pyra Mithra and there only being 2 unannounced fighters left, the next one had to be Tekken. It doesn't help either that his announcement trailer was one of the calmest and least exciting trailers out there. It was funny, but I don't think it was very hype. Maybe they expected people to have the same, this is going to be Tekken, mindset as me, and therefore they didn't make it anything bombastic. Anyways, none of that really matters. What do I think of this character in Smash? And uh, this is going to sound really weird, but stick with me. I absolutely hate playing this character. And yet, he is my favorite character in the game. Here's the deal. I've said before that I don't really play Smash Ultimate anymore outside of making videos for it. I stopped playing this game right around the time the Fighters Pass 2 started coming out. I of course tried every DLC character out with some friends, and when it was Kazuya's turn, I've never felt so hopeless in playing Smash. He doesn't play like Ryu, Ken, or Terry at all despite also having special inputs. And yeah, I don't play this game anymore, but I still love watching the game competitively. I've been watching top level Smash since even before Brawl came out with my brothers, and to this day it's one of my favorite fighting games to watch. Another fighting game I love to watch is Tekken 7, and since Kazuya is so one-to-one -one in Smash as he is in that game, you probably know where I'm going with this. Kazuya is my favorite character to watch at top level in Smash Ultimate, which outside of making videos is all I really do with this game nowadays. Kazuya has been under fire recently from the community, alongside Steve for being, uh, broken, according to salty people, and as someone who doesn't play this game at a competitive level for money, I am all here for it, man. One of my close friends, Hush Puppy, has been gaining notoriety lately online for being a high-level Kazuya main that plays on a box controller. He's even the guy that did that back throw on Sonic that KO'd at 39%, which went viral on Twitter. Nothing has been more fun recently than me and my friend group getting together to watch Hush Puppy play and wreck ass with Kazuya in tournament while we're all just going crazy over Kazuya landing 0 to death after 0 to death, or doing like 80 damage in one string. And it's not just because he's my friend, watching other top Kazuyas play is a delight too. I just obviously have some bias if it's someone I know. So Kazuya as a character is great. I absolutely love his moveset even if I can't use it at all. Watching it is good enough for me. But how about his stage? Mishima Dojo. F okay, so remember how I said his announcement didn't excite me all too much because I saw it coming anyways? Here's a recreation of what was actually going through my head as I watched his reveal live for the first time. Oh my god, who is this? Wait a minute, this is the Tekken cliffside thing. Nice, Tekken's finally in Smash. It's Kazuya. That took for Oh my god, wait a minute, his stage. Oh my god, please, please! No! Why? Because I'm telling you, I wanted nothing more than the Tekken 7 stage Infinite Azure in Smash. Whenever I watch competitive Tekken, seeing them play on this stage is always great because it's just so good looking and straight to the point, while having fantastic music. 
The rare trope of infinite waters that you can walk on is always raw as hell. Skyward Sword, Xenoblade 1, kinda, and Tekken 7. Infinite Assert is the coolest fighting game stage of all time, and it's also incredibly iconic. So imagine my immense disappointment when that wasn't the stage they ended up going with for Smash. I get that Mishima Dojo is more lore important than Close to Kazuya, but man, I really don't care. Tekken is a fighting game, lore really isn't that important, man. If you're someone who works for Nintendo, please look away from the screen for a bit. Everyone else, look at this modded version of Infinite Assert in Smash. This is fan-made and it looks fantastic. Imagine if this was the official stage made by the actual Smash team. I would have lost it. As for what they actually ended up going with, Mishima Dojo... Uh, the mechanic of breakable ceilings and walls is kind of neat, but in actuality it doesn't really enhance the game for me that much. It's a mechanic that's just kind of there. That's literally all I have to say about this stage honestly. It's a flat plane with destructible edges that after a while regenerate. Hayashi is in the center and he reacts to KOs which is kind of neat. And though I usually don't care too much, the battlefield and Omega forms are also really boring. The actual platform you fight on is kind of cool looking, but everything else here is just mountains at night. Cool dude. So I'm not a fan of the stage, for uh, multiple reasons. But now let's just move on to the music. And whoa, okay Kazuya, I see you. Trying to be like Terry, are we? I'm about it. Just like Terry, his fellow DLC fighting game character, Kazuya brings a ton of music to Smash. 39 tracks in total, which is 11 less than Terry, but unlike him, they're actually all from his home series, Tekken in this case. Of those 39 songs, 8 are new remixes, which is of course very solid, and I would never complain about that. Tekken music is incredible, and almost all of these remixes are great too. Dojo Japanese style mix is the only one I'm not a big fan of, but then you have Desperate Struggle, Moonsiders First, and Aloneness, the last two of which are two of my favorite remixes in the whole game. Moonsiders First is interesting because when it was first released, I, alongside many others, really didn't like it because it's arguably a massive downgrade from the original Moonsiders First theme, which I definitely agree with. The original is probably my favorite traditional fighting game song of all time. But then I started listening to it more, and some more, and then some more, and yeah, eventually I grew to really like it for what it does. And now I love it. I do still really hate it when a song gets a remix in Smash, it's less good than the original, and the original isn't also included. Like what's the case with the Counter-Attack remix in the Pyramithra pack I talked about earlier. But unlike that remix, I actually really like this song. So nowadays I'm fine with it, though I'm still really upset the original Moonsiders first isn't in Smash. Like come on, you're gonna put 31 non-remixed Tekken tracks in the game, but not the one from 7 that is arguably the most iconic song in that game? Come on. Karma and Kazuya Mishima Devil Kazuya are great remixes too. I don't really have a lot to say about the non-remix tracks, I love the fact that they put some goofy songs in here like Hitch and Yodeling Metal Hill though. And other songs like Poolside and Heat Haze Shadow are great too. Although have you ever heard the Heat Haze Shadow loop in Smash? It's kinda awful. Not a big deal though, but what do I think of this pack overall? Like I said, I can't enjoy playing this character at all, but I love his moveset and watching him competitively. It's kind of like Joker where I don't actually enjoy playing him, but other stuff around him make up for it, except that's way more the case here. The stage I really didn't like, but oh my that music selection is crazy, so I'm gonna give him a strong 8 out of 10. If his stage was infinite as her, or just better in general, this would have been an easy 10 out of 10. Seriously, I'm really bummed out about it not being Infinite Sir. Even long before Kasia was announced, I was wishing for that someday. So after Mr. Mishima, we were promised the last Smash Fighter to be revealed on October 5th, 2021, during the final Mr. Sakurai Presents. It was an exciting moment to be sure. And then it started. We got a quick scissor reel of all the base game characters, followed by DLC characters. Sakurai comes in, upsets Doom fans right off the bat and no one else, gives one quick heartfelt speech about Smash Ultimate's history up to this point, and then the final reveal trailer starts playing. The flaming Smash Ball that started this journey over three and a half years ago fades away, dropping one last little flame. Every fighter is a statue for some reason. Mario comes to life and steps off his pedestal, slowly walks up to the last bonfire, I mean flame, teases the absolute hell out of every Dark Souls fan, including myself, by grabbing the fire, throwing it away as it becomes some sort of fire sword, and then, bam, disappointment. Okay, I'm just kidding. So yeah, 
Sora from Kingdom Hearts ended up being Smash Ultimate's final character. My history with Kingdom Hearts isn't exactly positive, but I have no hate towards the franchise or its fans. It's just that I tried it, did not like it, saw a friend who loves Kingdom Hearts play it, and laughed my ass off because I can't take this game seriously in the slightest. In short, I'm not a fan of the series, but that of course doesn't matter. I can't change the fact that Sora is the last DLC character, and honestly, I don't think it should have been anyone else. Kingdom Hearts is a huge gaming franchise, and Sora is a very popular character. So much so in fact that the Smash Brothers fighter ballot they held back in 2015, where you could vote on which character you won in Smash, was won by Sora, like he was the character with the single most vote out of anyone. See, it was known for years that Sora was the most requested character to join Smash of all time, and obviously Sakurai and Nintendo knew that, but nobody believed it would ever happen since Square, Disney, and the creator of Kingdom Hearts, Tetsuya Nomura, are all notoriously stingy with their IPs. So when it actually happened, it was kind of a gigantic deal, and regardless of who it was, it would have been pretty emotional anyway since they would be closing the door on Smash Ultimate. Anyways, all that aside, what do I think of his implementation in Smash? Look at him, he's really here. Yeah, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, I uh, I don't really care. I don't hate him or anything, he's just one of those characters to me that's just kinda there. I have no strong feelings about him one way or the other. He plays super weird to me. A floaty aerial based sword fighter is just not an archetype I would expect to like playing. If I get him when I'm picking random, I'm not gonna groan or anything, but I'd prefer someone else. There's really not much else I can say about his moveset. The mechanic of his neutral special swapping each time I use it is pretty cool, but I hate the fact that he has a counter. I used to not care about them being added that much, but when it's around the 20th character with one, it feels kinda lazy at this point. I do however very much enjoy watching combo videos and such of him. There's something very pleasing about how he flows so smoothly. So let's just get into the stage, Hollow Bastion. And huh, not too bad actually. Layout wise it's nothing special, I mean it's basically the same thing as Hazardless Smashville, which is the same thing I said about Hazardless Spring Stadium. I really like how this stage looks though, I obviously don't know what lore significance the Hollow Bastion holds, but the castle in the background is really pretty, and I love how this part where the stage starts looks with the waterfalls and the ice. But obviously the best part about this stage is how when time remaining is low or someone has one stock left, it changes into this amazing dive into the hard form, which just looks gorgeous. And the artwork in the background is always different, this one being my favorite as the actual stage is pink. It is however really annoying that this doesn't happen if you have stage hazards turned off, seeing as it literally doesn't do anything, it's just a visual thing. The only reason I hate this is because this is a comparatively legal stage, and pretty much every tournament runs a hazards off rule set, so you don't get to see this in tournament when it should just happen. Really hope this gets fixed someday, although I doubt it. So far this DLC pack has been pretty okay right? Nothing too bad at all. But we have one more final stop left, the music. And ladies, gentlemen, etc, they did it. They found the absolute worst possible way to close out the music in Smash Ultimate. Seriously, what the hell am I looking at, bro? This has to be the most disappointing thing added to Smash Ultimate via DLC ever in my opinion. The Kingdom Hearts series undoubtedly has one of the most beloved video game soundtracks of all time. So what do they do to a franchise whose music is held in such impossibly high regards? Well, obviously they only put in 9 songs, pretty much no huge fan favorites, and worst of all, no new remixes. Now you might be saying, hey wait a minute Pjiggles, doesn't Sora come with 10 songs? You forgot about dearly beloved swing version. Well, no he doesn't. You get that song in Smash if you own both the Sora DLC pack and this whole other damn game. So no, this song isn't part of the DLC pack, which is what we're rating in this video. So we're not gonna count it. Getting back to the actual music list, the selection they picked blows. Night of Fates, Hand in Hand, and Fragment of Sorrow are pretty okay I'd say, but the rest I either don't like, or it's not very fitting for Smash Bros at all. There are some absolutely incredible battle themes in Kingdom Hearts that they just didn't include, like the 13th Struggle, and this one that I can't pronounce the name of. And seriously, how is there no dearly beloved or simple and clean remix? Actually, I know why, it's because Square Enix has the crappiest stranglehold on their music as possible. Final Fantasy VII originally only had 2 songs and no remixes, and Dragon Quest has 8 songs but also no remixes, and those are the only other Square Enix franchises in Smash, you can't tell me that's a coincidence. Now to be fair, 8 out of the 9 Kingdom Hearts songs in Smash are from 1.5 and 2.5 HD Remix, which are collections of Kingdom Hearts games that did remake their original music, 
but they're still music ports, so it doesn't really matter that they're technically remixes. I mean it, this music selection bumps me the hell out, and I know I'm far from the only one. What an absolute waste. But yeah, that's the final Smash Ultimate DLC pack. Featuring a character I don't have any strong feelings about one way or the other, a stage I really like with one big annoying issue, and an absolutely god-awful music selection. So what score do I give for this pack? I'm not gonna feel bad about this at all. A solid 4 out of 10. Character is nothing too special to me, moveset-wise at least, and while the stage is very pretty, it also has nothing special at all mechanically. But what really hurts this DLC pack to me is the downright criminally bad music list. So for that reason, I have to give him a low score like this. Anyways, that gives us our final ranking of the DLC packs, at least according to my amazing opinions. And not counting Prana Plan because it isn't part of a DLC pack and it's just a standalone downloadable fighter, from best to worst, we have Min Min at the bottom with a weak 1 out of 10, Violet and X with a 2 out of 10, Sephiroth and Sora both with a 4 out of 10. I'm just gonna put Sephiroth above Sora, don't mind me. At least he has good remixes, you know? Hero with a 5 out of 10, Joker with a 6 out of 10, Pyra and Mithra with a 7 out of 10, Kazuya with an 8 out of 10, Banjo and Kazooie, and Steve, two characters, tied with a 9 out of 10, at which I'm going to put Steve a tiny bit higher, because I said that if I did half scores, he'd have a 9.5 out of 10. And then we have our crowning king of DLC, Terry Bogart with an absolutely perfect 10 out of 10. I would not say this game got bad DLC overall, not by a long shot. It's important to remember that this was an opinion based list anyways, obviously just because I didn't like Violet or Sephiroth's DLC pack doesn't mean I think they're objectively bad additions, far from it. Smash Brothers is a crossover series at heart, so they're gonna try to appeal to as many different fan bases as possible, which is a good thing. I'm sure the 12 ARMS fans out there are ecstatic to have a character from this game they love in Smash. When it comes to my personal history with every character when they were announced for Smash, then uh, yeah, this whole DLC lineup honestly wasn't too great for me specifically, but that's okay. The chances someone had a good history with literally every DLC character prior to them joining Smash is honestly very slim, but they're probably out there somewhere. Big shoutouts to Lewis, Gurk, Sylola, Giant Firing Cole, The Game Didi, Noso, Lime the Chef, Ride the Yoshi, LurFX1, and the rest of my lovely supporters on Patreon. I recently started one and using their names as my Smash name tags for the first time in this video was a lot of fun. Hope it wasn't annoying cause you're gonna be seeing those names a ton more in my videos. Thanks for watching. Be sure to let me know in the comments what your least favorite DLC pack in this game is, because that's way more interesting to read than who your favorite is, though you can also comment that if you want. Don't forget to like the feeder if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't already. I hope to see you back here soon for something that's pretty long overdue by now. Anyways, have a great rest of your day.